Susan, as neuroscientists, we know that neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. the changing brain, is one of the most important concepts that we've learned in recent decades. Mm -hmm. And so when we have the, the concept of the biology of the brain that's so plastic, and we have society that's so dramatically changing mm -hmm. in terms of our interactions with it, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of future can we look forward to? Well, I think it's in our hands, and it's really interesting um, if we go through that syllogism, that one, the human brain is exquisitely evolved mm. to adapt, as you say, to the environment. Two, the environment is changing in unprecedented ways. Three, therefore, <laughs> the human brain will be changing in unprecedented ways. Now, um, to say, is it good or bad, I think is like saying, is a car good or bad? Mm. You know, Clearly, it's a much more complex question that has to be unpacked. Uh, I think the first issue, and sometimes I get criticized um, for saying that this is unprecedented, is to distinguish between what we could call the cyber culture, if you like, the culture of the screen, um, and how that is different from things like the printing press or the car or the refrigerator um, or the television. So some people say, oh no, this is just another, another march of technology. Mm. I don't think it is because technology in the past was always a means to an end. A car was a something enabled you to get somewhere um, quicker. Um, the printing press enabled you to find out about the world. A fridge enabled you to keep your food chilled. But it, uh, the TV, even I grew up with the TV, that was like the Victorian piano. That was the center of our family. Mm -hmm. It didn't introduce a new way of life. It actually was a catalyst for the family to interact, just as in the old days, the piano in Victorian times was a catalyst for the family to interact. Now, however, this cyber culture for many has become not a means to an end as those other technologies. And it's become itself. an end in itself. People will spend a lot of time and money playing video games for no purpose other than the experience, the here and now experience of the video game. So I think what we need to do is to really explore where we're headed here. And as you say, can we look forward to it or is there, are there problems? And I think the first issue is we need to unpack it into separate questions. And the first, let's take video games, are questions such as, is it addictive? Yes, it is. It seems to be for about 10% of people. Does it um, evoke aggression? Yes, it seems to evoke low-grade low aggression. That's to say that you don't go out and kill someone after you've killed someone mm. on video, but you'll be a little bit more hostile if someone bumps into you than you perhaps would be normally You have a more aggressive attitude. Um, and will it habituate your normal human sense of, uh, of revulsion about well, those my things? Idea, because yes. you have an habituation yeah. to that. Well, also, you're living in a world with gaming where guess what? People can be undead. Now, mm. normally in life, actions have consequences. And I think it's a very dangerous lesson, especially for a young person to learn with their ever so plastic brain, that actions don't have consequences, that the next time you play the game, the person's alive mm. and well again. And I think that although it sounds incredible that anyone would think this was reality, if you are spending four, five, 10 hours a day doing this, if this is your world, this is your culture, then clearly your mindset's gonna be different. And then another one is on social networking sites and how you interact with others, how much empathy you have for others, um, how you see yourself. Do you define now your identity externally by your mm. number of Facebook friends? Mm. And I saw a, very, a really interesting clip of two girls in Hollywood and the reporter said to them, um, how do you feel sitting inside as they were um, the respond car, chitty, chitty, bang, bang. They said, how do you feel sitting inside chitty, chitty, bang, bang? You know what they said? This is Facebook worthy. That was their first thing. Not I feel this or I feel that, but this notion that you're living your life for approval and this rather narcissistic approach. There's another separate issue entirely. And then another one is how you search engines. What do we mean by information versus knowledge? What do we mean when we look up a fact? How do we understand that fact? And I think, again, that's a separate issue. So without going too much, in depth, I think we can ask lots of separate questions. And what I find interesting is there's certain parallels, as I like to think, with, with climate change. And I've called this mind change. If you think about it, climate change unpacks into lots of separate questions, carbon sequestration, alternative energy, water shortages, and, and so on, all subsumed under this, mm -hmm. this catch phrase, this umbrella phrase. Um, climate change is unprecedented. Um, we don't know where we're headed. There's, there's no um, signs or clues from previous times. It's of global relevance. It's of relevance to the private and public sector. And it's highly controversial. Some people think that we're doomed. Some people think it's exaggerated. Some people think science can help. Mind change, similarly, unpacks into lots of separate mm. questions about identity or addiction or learning and information and so on. 
Um, it's of relevance to both the private and the public sector. It's of global importance and it's unprecedented and it's controversial. The only difference, I have to say, the only difference is that whilst, as I understand it, climate change is damage limitation, we're just trying to put the brakes mm. on, mind change could actually be could actually be the most wonderful opportunity for us to shape a new environment, to design an environment for this oso-plastic brain that meant for the first time human beings, our mass could really reach their true potential. Hmm. All right, let's uh, segregate two of the aspects mm. that you brought up. One is the negative side, which is the addiction mm -hmm. and the potential uh, uh, desensitization of mm -hmm. your emotions versus yeah. vi on violence or other, other kinds of things. Those are the negative side. Mm. And, and I think those are real. You said 10% of the population yeah. might be affected in the addiction. Mm. Okay. I'm more interested actually in, the, in how the whole uh, cyber culture, search engines, knowledge approach affects uh, mm -hmm. our way of thinking yeah. and our a way of knowledge. I mean, I've seen a dramatic change yeah. in myself and yeah. how I use yeah. search engines and, and, and I'm, I'm much mm -hmm. less likely to force myself to remember things. You yeah. just have to remember yeah. how to do things. Mm -hmm. And the capacity today mm -hmm. where I have to do many things sure. is enormously more than it, mm -hmm. it would have been 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, how how do you see that part in terms of the accelerating uh, impact? What do we gain and what do we lose? I think that's a really complex question. And let's look at the gains first, because I don't want to come across as some kind of cyber Luddite. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, it has been suggested um, by someone called Stephen Johnson, actually, who wrote a book, Everything That's Bad Is Good For You, that perhaps if you are obsessionally... Um, playing video games, this might actually improve your IQ because the same kind of mental agility required um, in a video game of looking at patterns and connections within a certain time frame to get to a solution are the same kind of skills and mental agility required when you're doing IQ tests. But as he says, just because you might have a raised IQ and just because as we are, we're seeing in general in certain societies IQ scores on average increasing, we haven't seen a concomitant increase in insight into the economic situation of the world or into the Middle East crisis. So just because you can process information quickly and well, effectively turning yourself into a computer, does not mean to say you understand it or have insight. And I think what we need to be very careful about is separating information from knowledge. So just because you can process things quickly, and I don't want to knock it, fine, great, if you're doing these things, does not mean to say that along with that is guaranteed to have understanding. Yeah. So well, that's, that's the first thing. The, the, yeah. I think there are, there's th three things. Yeah. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's information, there's knowledge, and there's wisdom. Yes. Or a reflection on the yeah. knowledge to produce uh, yeah. socially valid yeah. uh, results. Well, well let, let's take that further. Um, why is it that wisdom is usually attributed to people when they're older? You very rarely talk about wisdom in a 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. And I think wisdom is when you can start to generalize from experiences mm -hmm. to reach more abstract truths about what's going on and, and so on, which is why I say in cultures sadly other than our own, um, having a gray beard or a white beard is something mm -hmm. that's a, a status symbol or mm -hmm. is revered mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the culture, sadly, that we live mm -hmm. in where um, one has to have Botox and so on. But anyway, that's a separate <laughs> issue. I think what's very interesting is to uh, say, look at the pluses and the minuses. I think one of the pluses as well is that it's very good for training. It's very good for training surgeons, apparently, and laparoscopic surgery. It's very good for, dare I say, the military. But perhaps there we see the downside as well, because perhaps if you're training to drive drones on, on such a device, you actually start to see the world much less personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that one of the problems is, yes, you might improve your sensory motor coordination, you might be very fast and efficient at your responses, but what I, I'm concerned about is what goes on inside the person when they're doing this. And I, I think at the moment, the emphasis in the cyber culture is one for speed and external appearances, whether it's how you come across as a person on Facebook or how quickly you give the right response to something as opposed to what's happening inside the person. And I fear, and I, we're all like this, that we're going to be increasingly more and more connected. And there's a psychologist at MIT, you might know, Sherry Turkle, hmm. who's written a book called Alone Together. And she says that sadly, the more connected people are, paradoxically, the more isolated and lonely they feel. It's another phenomenon as well, mm -hmm. is that the, what the internet does, it used, it used to be said in the early days that the internet would get everybody access to everyone else and people would understand each other more. And in fact, the opposite happens in, in that you're only attracted to your own inner yeah. in group, whatever you're interested in. Mm -hmm. You're just in chess or yachting. I mean, in mm. benign things, you'll focus on just those people mm. and your, your, your environment will become more and more uh, closed. So you'll be 
connected yes. with more people, but there'll be specialists in stamp collecting of, and no one else of yeah, like-minded yeah. people, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the and the different uh, uh, clusters of like-minded people drift more and more apart, whether it's politically or religiously yeah. or just hobby-wise. Mm -hmm. And this is a significant problem. Yeah, well, I think it's also a problem because people don't have time to get to know people. Mm. Because if you're you're not the average person on Facebook, I gather has 150 so-called friends. I have myself, I don't know how many you have, I have about 10 friends. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're bad enough. They take up enough time and energy <laughs> and so on, you know, just sustaining mm -hmm. friendship and relationships with those. Mm -hmm. So it, I think it devalues the notion of friendship. Um, and I think also that it can be very hard for people. If you're constantly in cyberspace, for every hour you're in cyberspace, that's one hour less, not giving someone a hug. Not looking someone in the eye, not walking along a beach, not feeling the sun on your face. So, how whatever the merits are of the cyber culture as you're interacting, no one can deny, even its biggest apologists can't deny that every hour you're spent in front of a screen is one hour not doing something else by by definition. And we know that when you first meet someone, eye contact, body language, voice tone, physical contact all play huge importance to how you empathize and how you understand how someone's feeling. If you have a young person, especially, who's never learnt those skills. And remember, of course, you said the brain is very plastic. Mm -hmm. It's good at what it rehearses. If it's never rehearsed eye contact or body language interpretation or when to hug someone, but you're constantly saying, hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? In these rather mm -hmm. sort of um, short telegraphic mm -hmm. sentences, how will you ever learn how to understand someone else or how to develop a relationship with someone else? And if you take it to the extreme, I think this is something that we really do need to think about.